In this presentation, we'll continue with our assessment skills, taking into consideration inflammation, and then physical and functional assessments. So again, we've talked about inflammation before and looking at those negative and positive acute phase proteins, but we'll go a little bit more in depth. And so looking at inflammation, so again, this is a protective response from the immune system in response to infection, acute illness, trauma, toxins, chronic disease, and physical stress. Now, inflammation may be acute or chronic. So our acute inflammation is short-term reactions in which the mediators have short half-lives and are quickly degraded. So this is something that occurs for a short period of time and then improves. For chronic inflammation, the body continues to synthesize inflammatory mediators, which can affect normal physiological processes. So mediators are released from damaged tissue, blood vessels, and activated immune cells. So for example, one of the most famous ones is histamine, which is a mediator released from mast cells, which causes vasodilation, and capillary permeability, which leads to its famous symptom of swelling. Inflammatory conditions trigger the release of eicosanoids and cytokines. Cytokines are produced by white blood cells, and eicosanoids are synthesized from dietary fatty acids. So our cytokines are proteins produced in cells that cause other cells to proliferate, differentiate, migrate, or become activated. So they're kind of like hormones and then they tell other cells what to do, but they're much more localized in their effect. So that cytokines act as messengers, they affect the behavior of other cells, and they're also referred to as lymphokines or interleukins. Now again, just as a review for our acute phase proteins, so plasma proteins that increase or decrease by at least 25% during inflammation, illness, or stress, and so our positive acute phase proteins, remember these increase, and our negative acute phase proteins decrease. Here again, you can see, so we discussed and focused on specific ones when we're looking at laboratory and biomarkers. There are more, so here you can see a more complete list, but realize that we don't look at all of these, especially from a nutrition standpoint. So some common cytokines. So looking at the interleukins, we have interleukin 1b, interleukin 2, and interleukin 6. You also have interferon and tumor necrosis factor. So looking at the functions of these cytokines, so interleukin 1b inhibits the production and release of transferrin while stimulating the synthesis of ferritin. And so remember that transferrin is our transporter, so this is our iron transport protein and ferritin is our storage protein for iron. Cytokines reorient hepatic synthesis of plasma proteins and increase the breakdown of muscle protein to meet the demand for protein and energy during an inflammatory response. Now with a decline in negative acute phase proteins, again, this doesn't always accurately reflect nutrition status. So realizing that when we see this low albumin, this low pre-albumin, Again, we want to consider that the patient may be in an inflammatory state. Now here we have an example of cytokine actions and nutritional consequences. So we can see this, again, specific organ system on the left with cytokine modulated behavior and the consequences from a nutrition standpoint on the right. Now again, where we talked about that a lot of these positive and negative acute phase proteins, these interleukins and cytokines, a lot of them are studied, especially when you're looking at from an immune response and immunology, but for our purposes, right, we're really focused on the nutrition effects. So looking at treatment with omega-3 fatty acids, so this is associated with a reduction in tumor necrosis factor and interleukin 1b, an overall reduction in inflammatory biomarkers through increased fruits, vegetables, and nutritional supplements has generated mixed results. Again, though there's no harmful side effects, um, but again, this doesn't always necessarily guarantee a decrease right, in these hormone inflammatory biomarkers. So more research is needed to identify various dietary components and their effects on inflammation. All right, let's take a look at physical and functional assessments. So one thing we'll be looking at is the anthropometry. And so these are physical measurements of an individual related to standards that reflect the growth and development of an individual. We'll also talk about body composition, which refers to the distribution of body compartments as a part of total body weight. 
And again, in our nutrition assessment, we're going to want to include both anthropometrics and body composition whenever available. So again, looking at our anthropometrics, we're going to be measuring body size, weight, proportions, composition. Again, our goal here is to establish and evaluate for overnutrition or undernutrition. Now, it's very important, though, that we get accurate measurements. Otherwise, when we're comparing them to a standard, right, we won't actually get accurate information. And so individuals need to be trained in the proper technique to assess these anthropometrics. Now, again, these can also be used to monitor the effects of nutrition interventions to see if someone is continuing to grow, to see if someone is continuing to regain muscle mass, etc. So looking at the anthropometrics for height. So again, just as a quick review, the height conversion. So one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. So remember, this is nutrition science. So whenever you're looking at research articles or often in computer results for patients, you're going to see it in metric system because, again, this is nutrition science. So for example, if a patient is 70 inches tall and we want to convert that to centimeters, 70 times 2.54 is equal to 177.8 centimeters. And on the flip side, if a patient is 177.8 centimeters and you're trying to figure out how many inches that is, 177.8 divided by 2.54 will tell you that they are 70 inches tall. Now one thing to remember is that 6 feet is 72 inches, not 60 inches. 60 inches is 5 feet tall, and I cannot tell you the number of times I have had nurses confuse this, and they will put 60 inches tall, and the patient is 6 foot 0 inches tall. So remember that 6 feet is 72 inches, and so a patient who is 6 foot 3 is 72 plus 3 more inches for 75 inches total. Now when assessing height, we want to make sure that we always measure height and not just ask. Again, people are very prone to either misremembering or not knowing their true height. So height is one of the most inaccurate measurements found in medical records. So again, height is always assessed without shoes. And so we're looking at so me methods for standing height for children and adults. So if they are over the age of two, they can stand up. And so we use our stadiometer. So you are barefoot and you stand with shoulders, heels, and buttocks touching a vertical surface. And then if we're doing a recumbent height, or if the patient is laying down, we're going to use a tape measure. So when a client cannot stand, again, we said there are other methods to measure height. We can use the arm span method, which includes the full arm span, so measuring from, finger, from middle fingertip to middle fingertip. We can also use half span, so if the patient is taller than you, you will not be able to stretch a tape measure their full span because their arms will be longer than yours. So instead we use half span, which goes from the tip of the middle finger to the middle of the sternum. We can also use knee height, which measures from the bottom of the heel to the top of the knee, and there's a specialized caliper. There's also a tape measure method, but it's much easier to use the caliper, which is what we will practice when we are back on campus. And then you just plug this formula, I'm sorry, you plug this number into the formula to estimate height. Now we can also use segmental height for contractures, paralysis, scoliosis, kyphosis, cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, etc. In which case, right, we go from the heel to the knee, the knee to the hip, the hip to the shoulder, so on and so forth, and we measure the body's height in segments. There is an appendix in the book. Here you can see the formula for knee height. And again, we do have a knee height caliper. So again, you would just plug in that number, right? So from the heel to the knee, and then you would have the estimated height. Now looking at length. So again, we actually call it length for children under the age of two. And so what we use is a stationary headboard with a movable footboard. So you'll see you orient the child, right? So that their head's touching the board. You get them to straighten out their legs, and then you slide the footboard up. Then we record the length as a percentile on the growth chart. So if they are over the age of two, you're going to see height for age, and they're going to be measured standing. But if they're under the age of two, we're going to do length for age. We'll also do weight for length and BMI for age in pediatric patients. So here you can see 
a drawing so you can see how we have a stationary headboard and a movable footboard. Looking at weight, so weight should be measured on admission, and it is the most common anthropometric measurement. Now weight is just a gross measurement of all body compartments and does not distinguish body composition or fluid shifts. And so weight is a vital component of nutrition assessment due to its relationship with growth, development, and overall health. Now similar to height, we do have a conversion for metrics. So 2.2 pounds equals one kilogram. So if a patient is 150 pounds and you want to know how many kilograms they weigh, 150 divided by 2.2 equals 68.2 kilograms. On the flip side, if a patient is 68.2 kilograms and you want to know how many pounds this is, 68.2 times 2.2 is 150 pounds. Now we'll also remember that one kilogram is equal to one liter when we're discussing water. And since the human body is mostly water, this will become very important later on. Now to get the most accurate weight, we want to weigh the patient with minimal clothing and without shoes. We want to weigh them at the same time each day. And we want to weigh them after their four first morning urination. We want to make sure that scales are calibrated, so especially scales that are moved frequently, that really requires a specific type of scale. So for example, when you've seen the balance beam scales at the doctor's office where they have to move the weights, um, those scales are not designed to be moved. So anytime you move them, they need to be recalibrated. But there are electronic scales that you'll see in the hospital that are designed to be moved. And so then you just have to zero them out and they remain accurate. Now there are different types of scales, so depending on what your hospital is equipped with. So there is the infant scale, which you can see below, which looks very similar to a food scale, just has side walls so the child doesn't roll off. There's the balance beam scale, which is what you're probably used to with your height at the doctor's office, where they have to do the clank, clank, adjust, clank, clank. There are electronic scales. There are wheelchair scales, and so they actually are actually have a, a very, very slight ramp so that you can roll onto them. They then actually then lift the gate up so that the wheelchair does not roll off. And we just have to subtract the weight of the wheelchair from the patient's total weight. There are bed scales, which is they are built into the bed. So as long as they are zeroed before the patient gets on the bed and you know if they were zeroed with how many sheets, blankets, pillows, etc., they're, they're pretty accurate. And then you see we also have a photo of what's known as a Hoyer scale. And so what this is is for patients that are immobile or not strong enough to stand is we can actually so... Uh, it's like a supportive nylon straps and so what these do is these are slid under the under the patient the patient is then lifted up and we can assess their weight now looking at how we determine ideal body weight and so this is known as the ham we equation or the ham we method so this is from the 1960s so the formula for men is 106 pounds for the first five feet plus six pounds for every inch over five feet. So for example, a patient who weighs, I'm sorry, a patient who is 70 inches tall, what is their weight? So remember that this person is five foot 10. So 70 inches is five foot 10. So 106 pounds for the five feet and then 10 times six for the additional 10 inches tells us a body, an ideal body weight of 166 pounds. For women, the formula is 100 pounds for the first five feet and five pounds per every inch over five feet. So if a patient is 63 inches, what is their ideal body weight? So again, it's gonna be 100 pounds for the first five feet. And then we have an additional three inches. So three times five pounds for each additional inch gives us an ideal body weight of 115 pounds. Now, one thing is that the Hamwe equation does not adjust for age, race, or frame size. And so its validity is so-so, but it is used widespread by clinicians. And again, it does give us some comparable standard. Again, it's not perfect, but we don't have a better method yet available. 
Now, the other question that I often get, though, is what if someone is under 5 feet tall? And so for that patient, we subtract 2.5 pounds for each inch below 5 feet. So for example, if a patient is 4 foot 9 inches, that is 3 inches less than 5 feet, we use 100 pounds for the 5 foot tall woman, and then we subtract 3 times 2.5 pounds per inch because they are 3 inches less than 5 feet, giving us 92.5 pounds. Now the reason why we need to know ideal body weight is we will also be calculating percent ideal body weight. And so percent ideal body weight is current body weight divided by ideal body weight times 100%. So if a patient weighs 210 pounds and they are 71 inches tall, what is their percent ideal body weight? So first we need to determine their ideal body weight and so we said his, so this is a male patient. So this is 106 pounds plus 11 times 6 tells us an ideal body weight of 172 pounds. Now their percent ideal body weight, they actually weigh 210. We divide this by 172, and they are 122% of their ideal body weight. Now if you plug 210 divided by 172 into your calculator, you will actually get 1.22, but then you have to multiply that by 100 or 100% 100 if your calculator has that button. And that's how you will arrive at 122%. Another example, a patient weighs 82 pounds and her height is 61 inches. What is her percent ideal body weight? So again, first we establish her ideal body weight, which is 100 plus one inch over five feet times five pounds, tells us an ideal body weight of 105 pounds. For percent ideal body weight, we take current, which is 82 pounds, and divide by ideal, which is 105 pounds, telling us this patient is 78% of their ideal body weight. Looking at percent usual body weight, so here again we have a similar concept, but instead we're going to divide current body weight by how much the patient usually weighs. And again, this is still multiplied by 100%. So if a patient's current body weight is 167 pounds and they usually weigh 200, then 167 divided by 200 times 100% tells us they are 84% of what they usually weigh. For another example, a patient's current body weight is 256 pounds and they usually weigh 205 pounds. So their current body weight of 256 divided by their usual body weight of 205 times 100% tells us they are 125% of their usual body weight. Now again, the problem with this though is that we have to rely on the patient's memory to determine what they usually weigh. And so how do we calculate weight change? So here we have usual body weight minus current body weight divided by usual body weight times 100%. Which sounds really crazy, but if you actually look at the numbers it becomes pretty simple. So if somebody currently weighs 167 pounds and they usually weigh 200, the way we would calculate this is 200 minus 167, which would give us 33. And so you just take the amount of weight they've changed by, which is 33 pounds, and divide that by their usual body weight, in this case 200. And so what you find is that there's a 16.5% weight change in this case, loss. And so what this tells us then is that, right, they've decreased, right, so they've lost 33 pounds or they've lost 16.5% of their usual body weight. And in the reverse example, so a patient who currently weighs 
256 pounds. They usually weigh 205, so they've gained 51 pounds. 51 divided by 205 times 100% tells us that they have gained 25%, a 25% weight change, or they have gained 51 pounds. Now, the reason why this matters is that weight loss is highly indicative of the extent and severity of an individual's illness. Now, we do have our categories, so a significant weight loss is up to 5% in 30 days, up to 7.5% in 90 days, and up to 10% in 180 days. Severe weight loss is more than 5% in 30 days, more than 7.5% in 90 days, or more than 10% in 180 days. Now, along with these other anthropometrics, we're also going to, of course, take a look at BMI, which is our body mass index. Now, this is a ratio of weight to height, and we plot BMI for children over the age of 2, but we plot weight for length in children less than 2. Now, there's two methods to calculate BMI, and it's really the same method. It's simply metric versus imperial units. So for metric, it's weight in kilograms divided by height in meters squared. Or if you want to use imperial, it's weight in pounds divided by height in inches squared times 703. And 703 is your correction factor for using imperial rather than metric units. Now here we have our BMI reference guide. So again, less than 18.5 is underweight. 18.5 to 24.9 is normal weight. 25.0 to 29.9 is overweight. 30 to 34.9 is obese class 1. 35 to 39.9 is obese class 2. And over 40 is obese class 3. Now for infants and children, again, we do have these CDC growth charts, which you remember from life cycle. For 0 to 36 months, we assess length for age, weight for age, and weight for length. From ages 2 to 18 years of age, we monitor height for age, weight for age, and BMI for age. And again, these are recorded using percentile ranges. So for example, the patient is between the 25th and 50th percentile for weight for age, as we do not need to determine an exact percentile. There's also calculations for adjusting weight for amputations. Now there's two different sources of information, so again, we'll kind of discuss that and we'll also discuss that on the Zoom call. But here you can see the specific body part and the percent loss, and we'll talk about how you make those corrections. So this is from the Florida Diet Manual, which you do have access to via the library. Here you have from the textbook, you'll see the numbers are very similar but not identical. Again, this is why it's important that you make citations in your pocket guide so that you know the source of that information and where it came from. Again, these are small differences, but they are slightly different. So for adjusting weight for amputation, so to adjust the ideal body weight, you use the ideal body weight minus the percent amputation. And some terminology to be aware of, an AKA is an above knee amputation, and a BKA is a below knee amputation. So for example, a patient with an above knee amputation and a current body weight of 135 pounds, that is five foot four, what is their ideal body weight adjusted for amputation? So using the standard Hamwe equation, they would be 100 pounds for the first five feet and an additional four inches, so four times five, gave us our ideal body weight of 120 pounds. We then determined, looking at the previous chart, that for our amputation, this is 16%. So 120 pounds times 16% tells us that that missing limb would have weighed 19.2 pounds. So if they had both of their legs, they would weigh 120. We subtract 19.2 pounds, 
and their new ideal body weight is 100.8 pounds for the missing limb. From there, we calculate what is their percent ideal body weight after being adjusted for the AKA. And again, this formula stays the same, which is they currently weigh 135. You divide this by their new ideal body weight of 100.8, and we determine that they are 134% of their ideal body weight. Looking at BMI adjustment for amputation, so the BMI adjustment for amputation is current body weight divided by 1 minus the percent amputation. And remember that especially if somebody has had a bilateral amputation, to use their height prior to the amputation. So a patient with an above knee amputation and a current body weight of 135 pounds with a height of 5 foot 4 inches prior to the amputation, again, current body weight divided by 1 minus the percent amputation. So we take 135 divided by 1 minus 16% or 0.16. This is 135 divided by 0.84 equals 160.7 pounds. We then use this weight divided by our height squared, or in this example, height twice as it's the same thing times 703, which is our correction factor, gives us a BMI of 27.6. And so you'll notice their weight increased from 135 because if I were to put the leg back on the person, their weight would go up. So their weight increases, and this makes sense. Now looking at body composition, so in addition to our baseline anthropometrics, which just gives us this raw data. Body composition is used with these to provide a more accurate description of overall health. Now we need to consider frame size, that older adults have different bone densities. Muscular athletes may be classified as being overweight with their increased muscle mass, and changes in body composition and fluid may occur in the critical or acute care setting. Typically it's going to be the fluid compartments. So one of the easiest ways to assess this is skin fold. So skin fold thickness measurement is used to assess the amount of body fat in an individual. And calipers are used to measure this thickness of subcutaneous fat in millimeters. These are very practical in clinical settings, but validity depends on the accuracy of the person doing the measurements, which is why you will need lots of practice if you intend to use this on your patients. It is minimally invasive, so especially with the sites that we can use that make things very easy. Changes take three to four weeks to occur, and accuracy decreases with increasing obesity. So especially with skin tightness, etc., it's very difficult to get accurate measurements. Here you can see an example of a tricep skin fold. Again, this one is minimally invasive and very easy to obtain. Now skin folds are most reflective of body fatness when we use the triceps, biceps, the lower scapula, and above the iliac crest or suprailiac and the upper thigh. Tricep skin fold and subscapular measurements are most useful because the most complete standards exist for these specific sites. So again, if we're trying to get just one and keep things simple, these are the sites we focus on. Here you can see an example of the subscapular, the suprailiac crest or the top of the hip bone, here we have the triceps and biceps, and we'll actually go through this process when we are back on campus. Now, in addition to body composition, we also have waist circumference, which can, um, doesn't directly measure body composition, but does give us some estimates and some ideas. And so this is the measurement of the distance around the smallest area below the rib cage and above the umbilicus using a non-stretchable tape measure. And so the independent risk factor for disease, if over 40 inches for men, and over 35 inches for women, as fat accumulation in the abdominal area is linked to an increased risk of type 2 diabetes. And so here you can see, right, we should be right above the top of the hip bone if we've measured correctly. Now looking at waist to hip ratio, 
So this can be used to detect signs of excessive fat deposition, known as lipodystrophy, which is also in incorrect locations in those infected with HIV. Also helps us detect cardiovascular risk, as a ratio of 0.8 or above indicates risk in a woman, and a ratio of 1.0 or above indicates risk in a man. We can also measure mid-arm circumference. So this is measured in centimeters halfway between the acromion process of the scapula and the olecranon process at the tip of the elbow. And mid-arm circumference values are used to calculate arm muscle area. And so arm muscle area is in centimeters squared and is compared to a standard to provide a percentile, which tells us how much the muscle the patient has compared to others in that grouping. Here you will see the formula, and so you'll notice that it does use pi, as again, your arm is in the shape of a circle. So we're kind of using this idea that we're going to find area based on the circumference and then the amount of fat, and then we subtract the amount of fat, we can then determine how much muscle the patient has. Here you can see the standards, where again we have adequate muscle, marginal, depleted, or wasted. Looking at head circumference, so head circumference measurements are useful in children younger than three years of age, primarily as an indicator of non-nutritional abnormalities, as undernutrition must be very severe to affect head circumference, but head circumference is measured in centimeters at the head's greatest circumference. So here you can see, again, similar to if you were measuring a hat, right, you need the largest measurement around the head. We also have the determination of frame size. And so according to the NHANES, we have small, medium, or large frame sizes for men and women. There's a couple different methods to assess frame size. So method one is we can measure the greatest bony width across the elbow joint. So the arm should be bent in the 90 degree angle. We're going to use a different set of calipers than the skinfold calipers. We're going to take two measurements and use the average and convert this to inches. We then interpret, interpret this measurement by comparing it to a standard. And here you can see an example of the use of calipers, again, looking at the bony width of the elbow. Method two, we can obtain the wrist circumference and height of the patient in centimeters. And we then have the formula of height in centimeters divided by wrist circumference. And again, we have our standardized table to determine if this is a small, medium, or large frame. Other methods for measuring body composition. So we have air displacement plethysmography, aka a bod pod. And so here the client's total volume is measured indirectly by estimating the amount of air that is displaced within a sealed chamber. Again, there's the initial cost of purchasing the chamber. And again, this is not really used in clinical settings, but more so in health and wellness, as well as research settings. We can also use bioelectrical impedance analysis, or BIA. And this is based on the conduction of electrical current through the body, based on the premise that lean body tissue has a higher electrical conductivity and lower impedance than fatty tissue. And so here electrodes are attached to the right hand, wrist, ankle, and foot with small electrical currents. And again, we also incorporate age, gender, weight, and height. This is easy to use, portable, low cost, and safe. But again, we do need adequate hydration and we need to have a consistent hydration level between measurements if we want to get accurate results. Now you can see, right, so we do have the handheld ones which are much less accurate than when you see right on the lower part of the picture and you can see the ones that use upper body and lower body which are more accurate. Other methods of measuring body composition we do have dual energy x-ray absorptiometry or DEXA. So this is a series of x-rays so again this is a low dose radiation um, and they're basically slivers of the body and so the absorption rate of different body tissues allows for the calculation so this is still actually a calculation based on the picture Again, it's not a direct assessment. And we can determine mineral or bone mass, lean mass, and fat mass. Again, relatively easy to use compared to other technology, right? We simply lay you on the mat, make sure you're within the guides, step out of the room and hit the on button. So it's easy to use, emits low levels of radiation, 
Um, and again, it's becoming much more available in the hospital setting, especially because, again, its original intention is for the diagnosis of osteoporosis. We've simply adapted it to be able to measure it for body composition. Here you can see the DEXA scan. The only problem is, is that if we have obese patients or very tall patients, they may not fit within the measurement guidelines on the mat, and they actually make a specialized type of DEXA for patients that have unusual body dimensions. Other techniques that exist, again, uh, you're going to see these hardly ever, but just to know that they do exist, we have neutron activation, which allows measurement of lean mass, but again, it's very expensive and impractical. There's total body potassium, again here, so with a special counter that's fitted with gamma ray detectors, and again, 90% of the body's potassium is in fat-free tissues. Again, this is an expensive research technique that's not really appropriate for the healthcare setting. I don't find it to be too useful in the clinical setting. Again, you'll see it's a lot more in the research setting, but again, not something you'd really use in the hospital, but just be aware of underwater weighing or hydrostatic weighing. So this is the direct measurement of whole body density. So this is based on the principle that the volume of an object submerged in water equals the volume of water the object displaces. And so density is calculated once volume and mass are known. Um, so this is considered the gold standard for measuring body composition, but it has limited clinical use due to access to underwater weighing facilities. Again, there's not a whole lot of water tanks, you know, in the basements of hospitals to assess body comp, especially when we have access to DEXA, skin calipers, and BIA. So here you can see some examples. Again, typically used in research settings for validation of other techniques, but not typically used in the clinical setting. Other methods that are being explored include MRI or magnetic resonance imaging. So here we're going to use magnetic fields to produce images of the body. Although this can be used to measure the size of visceral organs, the size of the skeleton, or the distribution of intra-abdominal fat. So we have some additional uses beyond body composition. We also have ultrasound, which is safe, generally non-invasive, and uses high-frequency sound waves to create images of the inside of the body. And the sound waves echo off of the different tissues in the body and are reflected back to the transducer. And the echoes are converted into electrical signals and displayed on the monitor. So we can actually measure muscle thickness, fat thickness, etc. Again, though, for body composition measurements, these technologies are pretty new. But again, I do think in the future they're going to provide us um, some additional information beyond total body composition. So here you can see an example of MRIs in the bottom right and the ultrasound in the top left. Now we're looking at our nutrition-focused physical exam. So I'll describe what I can through the lecture, but realize that we are going to be also doing this in person when we are back on campus and cleared to do so safely. But equipment can include a stethoscope, pen light or flashlight, tongue depressor, scales, reflex hammer, calipers, tape measure, blood pressure cuff, and ophthalmoscope. Now examination techniques used during the nutrition-focused physical exam. So we have inspection, which is visually assessing the patient, aka using your eyeballs and looking at the patient. Palpation, where the patient is being felt. So Again, you're going to put your hands on the patient and feel for texture, size, consistency, and location. Percussion, where the examiner taps the body with fingertips or fists to evaluate size, borders, and consistency of internal organs or fluid in a body cavity. And auscultation, which is a fancy word for listening for sounds within the body. Findings that we are searching for with our nutrition-focused physical exam can be, for example, temporal wasting or a loss of fat mass at the temples depleted muscle bulk, dehydration or overhydration, poor wound healing, chewing or swallowing difficulties, so you can see a lack of dentition, skin, you're looking for pallor, so how pale they are, as well as scaly dermatitis, the presence of wounds, bruising, or tenting, which would help determine hydration status. Nutritional deficiencies can be detected in the skin, hair, teeth, gums, lips, tongue, and eyes. And the hair, skin, and mouth are especially susceptible due to rapid cell turnover. So again, we have particular areas to focus on. Now within that, we also have functional medicine with our functional nutrition assessments. So this is an evolving evidence-based discipline that treats the body 
with its mutually interactive systems as a whole, rather than as a set of isolated signs and symptoms. And so the focus is patient-centered, not disease-centered. An assessment includes pattern recognition, over and under nutrition, reduction of toxic exposures, and then identifying antecedents or events that may act as triggers for a response beginning a disease process. So here you can see the functional medicine matrix model, where again, in looking at combining this with our physical assessment, we're really looking at for what's the or, or origin point or what's causing the illness as opposed to just the symptoms themselves. So the functional nutrition assessment expands the traditional assessment by adding cellular, molecular, and genomic data and assessing influence from diet, environment, and lifestyle, a physical activity assessment, and we also use a tool known as a subjective global assessment, which has been validated to show a correlation with nutrition risk in hospital patients, as well as the patient-guided subjective global assessment. Now looking at malnutrition, which is ideally or historically what we've been identifying. So this has been associated in the past with low albumin and pre-albumin, but as we know from this lecture and the previous lecture, these acute phase proteins typically actually indicate inflammation and malnutrition has historically been frequently misdiagnosed. True malnutrition must have an intake component, which is they are not being, they are not meeting their needs through their intake. Now looking at our, some nutrition info on malnutrition. So total starvation is fatal in approximately eight to 12 weeks. And again, we're looking at absolutely no nutrition versus inadequate intake. That's inadequate intake, right, because of changes in adaptive thermogenesis um, can be significantly longer periods of time. 35 to 55% of patients admitted to the hospital are malnourished and 25 to 35% of patients in hospitals become malnourished during their stay. Now looking at the Aspen definition of malnutrition, it's any derangement in the normal nutrition status, including both over and under nutrition. Now primary undernutrition occurs if there is insufficient intake. Secondary undernutrition occurs from impaired utilization. So again, primary is thinking of, I'm just not eating enough of the food or nutrients, but the secondary is going to be causes such as disease processes, malabsorption, etc. Overnutrition is caused by excessive caloric intake and inadequate activity. Now some specific types of malnutrition. So we do have quashier core. So this results from severe protein deficiency with sufficient caloric intake. And this is a Ghanaian term for a disease that develops when the mother's first child is weaned from protein rich breast milk to a protein poor carbohydrate source or porridge. Now then we also have marasmus, which is the more classic when you think of absolute no nutrition or lack of intake. So this results from near starvation with a deficiency in protein and non-protein nutrients, as well as total calories. And we have the cachectic or wasted appearance where you can see the ribs, collarbones, etc. We then also have marasmic quashier core. So this is a combination of energy deficiency and or chronic or acute protein deficiency. Again, we're going to see the edematous or swelling and severe childhood malnutrition. So malnutrition exists when we have excessive intake of nutrients leading to obesity, toxicity, and organ impairment. Inadequate intake of nutrients leading to weight loss, deficiencies, and physical signs and symptoms. If we have increased nutrient needs, so again, we, our intake has stayed the same, but we have in increased needs with altered absorption or metabolism increased biological or physiological demand, decreased nutrient needs where we have impaired organ function or metabolism. So with protein energy malnutrition, we will see a loss of body cell mass, inflammation, diminished quality of life, poor immune response, decreased cardiac output and blood pressure, decreased oxygen consumption, decreased GFR, and ineffective erythropoiesis. Factors leading to malnutrition include an imbalance of caloric intake, psychological factors, physical, social factors, health problems, alcoholism, depression, restricted diets, mobility problems. And again, some additional terminology, we have starvation, 
which is a loss of body fat and non-fat mass due to inadequate intake of protein and calories. Sarcopenia or age-related sarcopenia is a reduction in muscle mass and strength. So again, with aging, we're going to see a natural decrease in muscle mass. Even with resistance training, some amount of muscle loss cannot be stopped. We have cachexia, so severe wasting that accompanies disease states such as cancer, and wasting, which is a gradual atrophy of body tissues associated with protein, energy, malnutrition, or chronic illness. To give you an example of a PES statement for malnutrition, so we would have malnutrition related to poor appetite and poor food selection, as evidenced by a diet recall showing consumption of only 1,200 calories per day, with a greater than 10% weight change over the past six months and a BMI of 18. We also have the ICD codes or the International Classification of Diseases. And this is how these codes and these malnutrition is actually diagnosed from a medical standpoint, which determines reimbursement. They also have the technical definitions which get updated every now and then um, to meet certain standards. So you can look these up. These are part of CMS as part of the government website. So let's review some practice questions. So anthropometry is answer choice C, involves physical measurements and compares or relates them to standards. Number two, which of the following is not a method of determining body composition? And this is B, indirect calorimetry which would instead be measuring metabolism, not body composition. Number three, a healthy body mass index for adults is between, and that is B, 18.5 to 24.9. And number four, Clinical assessment should include examination of the hair, skin, and mouth because and this is answer choice D, they are susceptible to nutrient deficiencies because of rapid cell turnover. Thank you for your time and I look forward to your questions.